morning and welcome to Open Line Online. It's Sunday, October 6, 2019. And do we have a lot to talk about? And do we have a very interesting panel here? And let me start to, uh, to introduce my panel. Uh, to uh, my immediate right is the minister, Dr. Abdul Hafiz Muhammad the East Coast Regional Representative of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan of the Nation of Islam. Assalamu alaikum. Okay. All right. We're going to start off, yeah, yeah, again, good morning <laughs> and welcome to Open Line Online here, Sunday morning, October 6, 2019, and it's good to be with you, and you see that we have a large panel, a couple Six. of new faces here, and um, let's uh, start to introduce. First up, Minister Dr. Abdul Hafiz Muhammad, the East Coast Regional Representative of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan of the Nation of Islam. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam to you, brother. Next to the minister is our own one half of the sports brothers, Bobby Childs. Good morning, Bobby. Good morning, everybody. And I see many of our viewers are already online anxious to talk about a continuation of what you were covering on the radio side. Wow, I tell you, it's interesting, I tell you. And uh, sitting next to Bobby is uh, on air open line host. Jennifer Jones Austin. Good morning. morning. Good morning. And sitting next to Jennifer, dear to my heart here, dear to my heart. But what is the third all? answer? Brother Mtume. There you go. Grammy Award winning. And Brother Mtume doesn't like all those accolades, but brother, you know, what you've did and, and done and, and continue to share your knowledge in music uh, and 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 um the arts and education is phenomenal, brother, and thank you, brother. Brother, you're very kind, man. I appreciate it, brother. And thank you for the 20-plus years. I got from those who came, who came before me. There you go. All right, sitting next to you is, uh, I said I had a new name for him. Oh, no. Not, I, not, I, I, well, I call him Brother Protest. <laughs> I call him Brother Protest. Leave it in Brother Protest. Larry Ham. Good morning, brother Larry. Good morning, good morning. And then our legal beagle over there. Uh, Mr. Afro, I call him with his shades on. <laughs> That's a turdy, former judge, turdy Bob Pecky. Good morning, Bob. Yes, indeed, for team, and good morning to all the folks out there uh, listening and watching us. And we're going to have a dynamite discussion this there morning. There you go. And as Bobby said, the listeners out there, and they want to continue on with the conversation. We're going to mix it up a little bit here. Well, of course, we, that's the, one of the top stories that we're going to get into, the Amber uh, Geiger case. Um, I just want to mention something that happened last week on the Open Line stream. I didn't mention it on air. There was a story that we did here on the stream. It was about the sixth, sixth grade uh, African-American girl said that she was held down by some white students at her school and her dreads were cut. And as you can see, it stated there on the monitor. And we did the story. We did the story last week to inform our listeners about the story. Well, come to find out uh, last week that this young lady, she lied. And we did say that last week, Rich, is we, we want the facts to come out. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully that it was not, it was one of those, those tough things I remember saying, which was um, we, hope it's a, we hope it's true, even though it's unfortunate that something like that would happen. Right. And then the very next day we come to find out that she had lied about the story. Is uh, she story. A Jesse Schmulet's little cousin? Well, that, that was, <laughs> that, that was the, the question out there, right? Is she, would she do what, uh, what Jesse did? You know, right. and, and it turned out to be the case, unfortunately. Yeah. So it, 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 it's, it's just sad to say, but, you know, um, if we report something and we find out updated information, mm -hmm. we give it to you. That's one thing. We're always transparent. It's what that. we call dealing with the actual facts. That's right. They're facts, but then they're actual facts. Facts should be truth. But they have to be tested and tried to make sure that they're actual. 
That's right. You know, and her family contain, contains, contends that she was still being bullied. Unfortunately, this was, you know, it didn't translate into the story that she actually told out there. So um, they're giving her counseling. Yes. Um, the yeah. family's going through counseling. Uh, it, it's mm -hmm. just, it, it's, it's just very, very unfortunate. Right. And she said something like that, that she's been bullied. So we have to watch this because you never know what is coming out of this story. Even though she lied, there may be something that is brewing deeper that there needs help here. So I just hope that if that's the case, that she gets the, and her family gets the help that you know. You know that, that, that's a very important point. But also, you know, being older, I think sometimes we get oversensitized. You know, everybody gets bullied. I got bullied. Yeah, I did too. But the way I was raised, you deal with a bully. Uh, I think sometimes we just extend a little too much leeway. Mm. You know, like for me, if I was that young girl, I know what would happen to me from my parents. Right. Mm -hmm. I would have got a spanking. Of course. And that would help. Yeah. So, you know, we got to, I think sometimes we get too soft with our kids. Mm. You know? Yeah. But well, some people say this is, I'm glad you it's brought it's up It's this about more about psych psychology and what, what's happening, psychologically, politically correct. Right. There's some things, I mean, you got to learn, or like you get in sports, everybody gets a trophy. No. Somebody <laughs> exactly. wins, somebody loses. Mm -hmm. You don't just get a trophy because you participated. Mm -hmm. I think there's a mindset that we have to rethink sometimes. Well, the question is, you, you know, did, it comes it, up. I agree. The time, times have changed, and things are different, but I put out the question to my family. You know, um, even though times so-and-so change, um, are we uh, were we better how we dealt with things in the past? And a lot of people say, well, you got spanked. That is a form of abuse and this, that, and the <laughs> other verbal and physical abuse. I I'll take a spanking. And I, you know, at the end of the day, um, I don't think I was abused. I don't feel traumatized. And I dealt with my daughters differently. Did I spank my daughters? Yes, I spanked my daughters, but I did not hit them with my hand. And I conversed with them more, and we talked about things more, because I do know that somehow my parents might have had a heavy hand, but I did not just eliminate spanking. Well, the word is right. Spare the rod spoil the child but if there's too many rods in succession that's abuse when i had a bully in my life he took my hat my fur hat he took my gloves then he took my coat and my daddy sent me the next day with no coat and says go back and get what's yours wow and when i was in wrestling class i did a move on him got back my coat my hat my gloves and his hat and his gloves <laughs> that didn't even belong to me. So you became a bully. So, okay. became no, a bully. I don't know about that, but the point is I gave All it back right. to him. If you took his That's stuff. the way you want to look at it. The bottom line is, yeah. no, I he gave it to me freely. Oh, yeah. 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 Yes, of course. Was that a quick pro quo right there? Was that your saying? Was that your quick pro quo? Yeah, yes. But I, you know you need to stop there. But I will say this. The young girl most likely did this because telling her version of truth, she wasn't going to be believed. Mm. And those that were are bullying her may have said that to her. And people say that when they threaten you, Jennifer. You know, you, you, powerful men have said to women, who's going to believe you? I'm the director. I'm the CEO. I'm this. See? They do it to little boys. Who's going to believe you? If you tell anyone, this will happen. So something was going on with her that she felt she needed to embellish the truth in order to get sympathy. Right. So, but the so one I factor... Hear, I'm, I'm, go oh, ahead, sorry. please. Go ahead. But the one factor I think that's important is consistency um, punishment uh, needs to be consistent and so the child or the young adult will get the information and be able to react and respond appropriately that's my so I'm gonna tell you all just my history. Look, I'm gonna sit here as, as, as the sole woman right now and tell you that when I was I think I may have been made about eight or nine on the school bus I was bullied by a brother my parents didn't know about it, and my, uh, my, my, my father could not have been a more powerful figure in my eyes mm -hmm. to deal with something, right? They didn't know about it until I was about 45 years old, <laughs> wow. right? And I had a bus driver who helped me out. So it's not always the case where people are coming forth and telling their truths and telling their stories right. for a variety of reasons. The other thing that I think is important to note with this particular individual, this young lady, and I don't know her, and we don't know her story. We don't know if her story 
is kind of a, a mask for something else going on in her life, yeah. in her family's life, where she's struggling for some attention. We don't know. It could be bullying. It could be something else. But we do see time and time again, little boys, little girls, big boys, big girls, sometimes they mask. They say one thing because it's a cry for attention for something else. I agree. We, we don't know the story yeah. here. It's, it's but, tragic, though, because whenever this happens, mm -hmm. then it what it does is, to your point, brother, what it does is it then reinforces in the minds of certain people, oh, this you know, these kids are making this up. That's right. Or this woman's making that up. When, some, when the truth or some form of the truth comes out, mm -hmm. then it discredits others who may have a legitimate story. Yeah. With situations like this, invariably the racists use this to try to downplay the very real millions of microaggressions that right. happened against African Americans and other people every day. This is a young lady that has some issues and I think counseling is the best way forward but we should not let that episode in any way diminish our press against racist attacks, racist violence that happen against black people every day. While this situation may have been made up, the situation in New Jersey with the young black wrestler, the high school student, oh, yeah. was not made up. And that referee has been, uh, I believe, suspended for several years. I think it's two mm -hmm. years, two years suspension. So these things happen every day. And unfortunately, this young lady has some issues, and I'm sure now, some steps will be taken to deal with it, but our fight against racist aggression, physical aggression, uh, continues, and, the, and, and this in no way diminishes the real incidents that do happen. For the viewers out there who are questioning whether she was forced to recant, um, the reason why the story fell apart is they looked at the video uh, around the time that she said it happened, and none of the suspects were around during that time, so there was no video evidence to sync up with her account of it. Um, so it doesn't appear as though she was pressured, and as many of us already said, um, there, there's something deeper going on with her that hopefully counseling will, will help exactly. unlock. So. Um, as Bobby, as we started this morning, and as Bobby had read the, the, um, some of the comments this morning, we're just gonna flip this, and no, we are not obsessed, obsessed by Donald Trump and the presidency, you know, it's just that this morning that we dealt with the whole, and rightfully so, the Amber Geiger case, and we're going to deal with it. But, you know, um, having this large panel, um, and we didn't get a chance to talk any politics over there, we're gonna start off with politics. Come on. You know, this t today, and I'm gonna start off with Sister Jennifer and Bobby Childs to talk about some of the things that has taken place this week. Jennifer, I'll start off with you in a sense of giving us a, a brief rundown okay. between yourself and Bobby Childs on, on the sense of what has taken place this week, dealing with the whole thing with this uh, impeachment, uh, a possible impeachment second inquiry. inquiry. Inquiry, right. and uh, <laughs> that's correct. And the whole, and, and, and the situ situation where there might be a second whistleblower going on. So it's a lot of things that is happening. So Jennifer. A lot happening. So I'll begin with, I was uh, working from home on Wednesday, I'm sorry, on Thursday, Thursday, and I happened to catch the president's press conference uh, with a, a, a foreign leader, and I believe it was the president of Finland, I believe it was. Can I just say that if this were not reality, it would be hilarious. You know, it would be the best sitcom ever produced. But you know, you want to laugh, but you can't because this is real. real. It's kind of like we're in, I, I keep to say, it's like we're in a reality TV show mm -hmm. and we're all the extras, but we ain't getting paid. Because it's, it's crazy, it's insane. We watch this man, he's on television imploding because he knows he's in trouble. He's losing, he never had a grip. But whatever little bit he might have had, he's losing all the more. So this week we had one, just one occurrence after the next. One thing unravel at the next. Beginning with, uh, we saw that some texts came out corroborating 
what the whistleblower's complaint said, that, you know, it seemed as though you had Trump and his political appointees slash his political cronies engaged in activities, quid pro quo activities, you know, favor for favor. So we're going to withhold the money in foreign aid, you know, that helps you fight against Russia's you know, encroachment. We're going to withhold that so at the, against the interests of national security for America for political gain for the president, right? So we had, we saw text corroborating that because we had career officials saying they thought something bad was up, that this wasn't right. We saw uh, Pompeo, you know, who just finally admitted that he was actually on that July 25th call where Trump was asking for a favor. He was supposed to turn over documentation that the three House committees, uh, you know, the Intelligence Committee, the Foreign Relations Committee, and the Judiciary Committee have requested in connection with this impeachment inquiry. He was supposed to return, turn over uh, documentation Friday, said he wasn't doing it. The White House and their claiming until you actually bring an article, article of impeachment and vote on it, we're not giving you anything. Doesn't have to play out that way, but that's the game they're playing. We saw him actually say he's going to block Pompeo, some of the state officials, from actually going to Congress and testifying in response to requests for information, subpoena, that he's going to block it and says he's doing it because they're being bullied by the House. <laughs> First time Pompeo and this White House have ever stood up for state officials, because you know they're always bashing them, always. saying they're not doing a good job. Right. What else did we see? That there's probably a second whistleblower complaint that actually gives even more evidence, because this person was closer to what was happening. And what we're also seeing that I think alarms me more than anything is that Trump and his cronies are now doing what this president has been doing oh so well for the last two and a half years, playing the spin game. Right. Positing that it's OK if we reach out to our foreign allies and ask them to investigate alleged corruption because we do so to protect American people, suggesting that this is nothing more than a continuation of a smear campaign that has been going on since Trump got there. So we're seeing what they're going to do is deflect, 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 distract, 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 and try to get everybody off of this House impeachment game and pretend that this impeachment is nothing more than, you you know, let's just try to get Trump because we know he's winning. And the concern that we all should have is that there are still a significant number of people out in this nation who are like Trump do or die, will ride with him to the end, and who will buy into this falsehood. And we, okay, you yeah. want to, yeah. I'm sorry, no. We have to, go okay. ahead. No, I, I give my time. <laughs> <laughs> We have to accept that that is the reality. His base is not going anywhere. Right. He tapped the vein. Minister Farrakhan said when he was running, he tapped the vein in white America of those poor whites mm -hmm. who wanted someone to champion their cause. Right. They have such a person. Now, Minister Farrakhan said on July 21st in a message he did before the world and from Mas Maryam, he said in scripture, there's no such thing as the word president mentioned. There's Pharaoh. He said, but the mind of Trump is not about being a president. He's an anomaly, as the minister said, November 16th, 2017 at the Watergate Hotel. He's not your normal prime of president, Bushes or anybody else. He thinks like a king. Here's the point to prove it. Not even the statement that in Israel, they call him the king of the Jews. And he said, he said himself, I'm the king of the Jews, but here's the proof right here with what you just said, Jennifer. President Trump has come out and said, not only did I say it to the Ukrainian president, I'm telling you, Chinese president, you investigate Biden and his son. I'm telling you, any other countries, you come and investigate him. See, that's a king. A king dictates. A king comes with his entourage, then they, he leaves them from behind and steps out on his own. And forget about teleprompters and anything else. This is what I'm going to do. So he's changing the narrative. And, you know, Republicans are good for keeping a certain narrative. He's even beyond the Republican Party. Because even with um, uh, Mr. Romney, Senator Romney and the senator out of Sass, Florida. Uh, and right. Rubio. Of Rubio. Rubio. Oh, oh. They are betwixt oh, right. with fully defending him, right. but not leaving him alone 
but saying, you know what, I think he's going too far, but Trump don't care about that. He attacks Romney. He attacks anyone because that's the mindset of a king that thinks I have subjects. And he's being very skillful in what he's doing. So we need to leave the thing alone that we're going to erode his base. It was shown when McCain went up against President Obama. President Obama in the second run won by 8 million votes. It was 60 million to 52 million. The minister then said the country is polarized. There's a group of whites in this country that are looking for a great, he didn't say this word, I'm saying it, great white hope to come along. Mm -hmm. And they now have that in President mm -hmm. Trump. So he said, I could go and kill someone on Fifth Avenue, right. and they'll still vote for me. So that's there. You understand? We're going to have to see how we go after the we now, those who believe in this process, mm -hmm. but how Americans go after the Electoral College. Remember what Trump said. He said, I never expected to beat Hillary Clinton in the popular vote. He don't expect to be, beat no Democrat in the popular vote. Mm -hmm. He said, I went after Electoral College, mm -hmm. and I won. Mm -hmm. And if that's not going to be the way that you mm -hmm. go in order to defeat him if you feel you need him out. But I say this, Trump in, Trump out. The system that upholds him is still there because it dogged President Obama for eight years with all the good that he tried to do and that he wanted to be. It dogged him. And it dogged him from the very beginning when they plotted and planned against him. Right. So mm -hmm. that mindset is there. So I close now saying that Mr. Trump has exacerbated that. And rather than cleaning the swamp, right. he himself is all in the swamp. He, he is the swamp. Right. He, he I, is the I swamp. I just want to throw, because Brother M. Tume, we, we got a chance mm -hmm. to talk this week about this. Of course, you've always talked about the Democrats and the Republicans, you know. One, you know, one is the bank robber, and one is the driving the getaway car. Uh, your uh, take. Uh, Democrats uh, drive uh, the uh, getaway car. Uh, uh, your, your thoughts on this whole <laughs> process, because you talked about, we were talking about uh, after the Mueller report, now with the Democrats now, moving forward on this uh, impeachment uh, inquiry. Um, what are your thoughts now? Well, f let's begin with this. Uh, you know, for the last 10 years, I've been talking about the need for a third party in this country. Right. And we get so hung up on, how is that possible? How do we do it? I said, you can't arrive at a correct answer until you have correct questions. The question is, what does these two parties, how do these two parties uh, uh, affect and work for us? We have the illusion of inclusion. See, when white people have a, uh, an election, half the white people lose, half the white people win. Half are sorry, half are glad. With black people, when Democrats lose, we lose hope. Why are we so psychologically tied into a Democratic Party? What do they do for us? That's the question I'm asking. So this whole thing of Trump is crazy, he's evil, OK, I'll go with all that. Right. But I told you on when I was still doing Open line. Right. Trump would win. Yes, you did. I predicted in June and July, when we had a conversation in August, I told you that uh, Elizabeth Warren would be the uh, representative for the, de for the Democrats. And I think she'll win. But the point being, what do we get out of it? See, there's a word called agenda. Every other group has an agenda. As far as the eight years of, 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 of the great Obama <laughs> administration, we were not the beneficiaries, black people. The gay community was, and I applaud them, because they had an agenda. We haven't had an agenda since 1963, when Dr. Martin Luther King and the leaders of the civil rights movement got together and were talking about withholding their vote until they talked to both parties. And, and Lyndon Baines Johnson said, if you give me the black vote, I'll give you a civil rights act. He did, they did, and he did. What have we demanded since? Nothing. And I'm tired of watching white people go down this rabbit hole. You've been going after Trump, but first it was taxes. Oh, he got it. And we act like it's got something to do with us. No. What is our agenda? Whoever wins, what are we going to demand? Your vote is not enough. You get nothing. See, power is the acquisition and maintenance of power. Where do we fit into the equation? So I'm not in, interested in uh, inquiries of, of, of impeachment. Impeach the man. Stop playing around with it. The Mueller report, they shot their whole wide. And I, I, I particularly felt he was embarrassing. What do we get? What are we proposing? Whoever wins. And it's time for us to think about a third party. Bobby? Well, you know, 
just to build off of some things that minister said right around um, th this King um, piece, right? And you go back and the, the Republicans are, are great to rally around the Constitution. Um, but if you truly believe what the founders of the Constitution did, they intentionally built the Constitution to prevent the behavior of what kings do. That's why they have multiple branches of government as checks and balances. So when you pull it forward, what Mike Pence has been saying, and, um, and actually Mike Pompeo been saying, they actually are obstructing how the government was set up to have oversight of it. Um, he talks about harassment when actually he, his boss is the one who's harassing uh, people to go out there and say, I demand to meet my accuser, the whistleblower, just as another sign he doesn't, he, he doesn't care or doesn't comprehend or some combination of both um, of, of how things are supposed to operate out there. And, you know, Minister, you talk about his comment about shooting somebody in Fifth Avenue and getting away with it. Well, he's actually doing that, right? He is shooting someone in Fifth Avenue and then telling you I did it, and then telling you you didn't see it, so it didn't happen. Uh, and that's what, he, you know, he, he just contradicts himself. You know, and so now when I look at the spin that's going on, um, and the, the spin here when the first whistleblower came out was, well, it was secondhand, he wasn't in the room, he made it up, blah, blah, blah. So now they got this second whistleblower who allegedly was in the room, and, um, and, and the, the dynamic that's going on is you have career um, states folks in there who this is their job, right? They've seen it through multiple administrations. They have a sense as to what's right and wrong. And then you have political appointees who have no idea how to do the things they do. And so their job is to protect. Um, and it started with Rex Tillerson and he shrunk the uh, State Department down there, mm -hmm. and he and a lot of the career. The well, well, under Rex, Rex right. under Rex, Rex yeah. was running, and he and his, down, and he's down. come out and he said, I, "I want a smaller. I can run it more efficiently, like the way he was running a business." So he he got rid of a lot of um, career, um, you know, state employees out there, state representative, not state representative, but the uh, State Department officials out there. So you you have this situation where you have. Um, career folks and non-career folks who are in there, and it's just a massive cover-up. And and we've always said it. What's worse is the uh, what's worse than the crime in many cases is actually the cover-up, and you see a lot of cover-up. And just the last thing, just listen to the spin, right? So now you're talking about Marco Rubio. You're getting some Republicans are saying, well, he probably shouldn't have said that, but it's not impeachable. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to, because they, they realize they have no place to hide. What he said is just wrong. It also may not be impeachable. It may not See, be. That, that, right. I, I agree with that. Let's that as but, not, but let's not admit, reality. something he, he, what he said was wrong. Whether it's impeachable mm. is going to go up to the vote. Yeah. I get that, right? Um, the other, the last thing, though, is um, his involvement with Rudy Giuliani. So the way these, uh, these tweets, these Text messages came up. You had this special envoy, Kurt, uh, Kurt Volker, who shared these text messages. And um, they're pretty damning, damaging uh, in, in that regard. Um, and he spent nine hours behind closed doors giving this testimony around it. And so the last spin that comes out is, and, and I said this last week, right? Um, you know, uh, Biden's son, someone still has to explain to me how a company is going to pay him fifty thousand dollars he a has month. no a month, a month a month he has no background in the energy business but again i'm not saying it's corrupt that speaks to a different set of questions out there right but for the republicans to jump on that i first say look at your own house because where does Giuliani's well, son work? Bobby, right. you agree, you I agree. agree. Where does Giuliani's son work? He works in the White House. What's his background to be working in the White House? The sons, the Trump sons coming out saying something's wrong. That whole Trump family has capitalized off the of nepotism going yeah, out there. You start with the Kennedys, the brothers exactly. the attorney general. I right. mean, if we're going to go in there, I know, I know you guys got a lot to say. I'll make this very short. My point is left wing, right wing, it's on the same bird. The bottom line, I'm going back to what the minister said, not just Trump, the Trump effect. If you get the man out of office, the mentality now has been implanted in this country. You see what I mean? Yeah. So, I, I mean, this whole thing of we keep running and getting all, I've watched two, I'm, I'm fatigued 
two years. Comey, he couldn't, oh, oh uh, the, the taxes, uh, what's the girl's name, mm -hmm. the woman, uh, uh, Stormy Daniels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it, on and on and on. The bottom line is, I think at a certain point, if you don't catch that rabbit by the tail, mm -hmm. you're going to run into fatigue. Right. And, 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 the, and the Democrats have this habit of overplaying their hand. Mm -hmm. Well, Trump is going to be impeached. He's going to be impeached no probably, uh, if not before Thanksgiving, before uh, the Christmas, before the winter break for the Congress. Um, he's going to be impeached because the Democrats have the votes to impeach him. And now some of the middle-of-road Democrats, middle-of-road meaning they're representing districts that are mixed. Mm -hmm. They got a lot of Trump people in their district. they scared, but now they've come out and they decided for impeachment. Impeachment is a great cloud. Impeachment is whatever Congress says impeachment is. Mm -hmm. Impeachment doesn't necessarily mean criminality. Right. It means that the Congress has deemed you but the to Senate, be fun the but, but, but let me finish. Yeah, go ahead. That, that the Congress has deemed your behavior to be inappropriate. So the House will impeach. The committees will formulate the articles of impeachment, the six committees that are involved. These six, these articles will be wrapped up in a bill, and that bill will be passed by the House of Representatives. And impeachment essentially means the president is being charged. Guilt or innocence will be determined by the yes, trial sir. that takes place in the Senate. Right. Now, heretofore, people have said Trump will, not be in, uh, Trump will not be found guilty because the Republicans have the Senate. Right now, if I was a betting man on this day, I would say that's correct. But the political environment is changing already polls show that a majority of the country favors impeachment. At a certain point, if the popular hunger for impeachment is strong enough, some of those Republicans will defect. Now, there are already cracks. Mitt Romney, Rubio, but Sass. there are some others. Flake said, Flake, Right. The former U.S. Senator from Arizona right. said that if there was a secret ballot, that 20 oh, yeah. re uh, Republican senators would defect. So I don't think it's a closed question as to whether or not Trump will be actu actually found guilty. Now, here's the other thing. On the Here, removal. Here's the, Just on right. the removal. Well, here's the other thing. Guilt by the Senate does not necessarily determine removal. You could actually be impeached. You yes. could actually right. be found guilty. That's and right. depending upon what you were found guilty of, not That's be removed. Right. Yes. Right. No president has actually right. been removed by That's impeachment. Right. I believe Johnson, Andrew Johnson, who was the vice president under Lincoln, who was the president that was impeached and was found guilty, was not removed. Well, you know, one other point, you're absolutely right, one other point that we need to take into consideration is what involvement did Pence have? And what came out this week is that Pence was more involved than was being let on, and that Pence likely knew more than was being let on. And so the reason I bring that up is that if they then go down the slate and they start looking at articles of impeachment for Pence as well, we can be certain, now this we can be certain, uh -huh. If it gets to a, a, a trial, a, you know, with removal as the punishment right. in the Senate for both the president and the vice president, it's that ain't happening happen. nope. because that would put Nancy Pelosi as the, as the president of the United States. Right. So we do know that we know they're not going to go all the way down the line. Let me just say one thing real quick. Uh, yeah, let, let, me just, thing. let me just add mm -hmm. uh, an addendum in agreement uh, with what has just been said. I think that the political environment is so fluid that we really can't predict what will happen. Mm -hmm. Because some of us could not have seen the events of the past year, mm -hmm. and true. others could not have seen the events of the year before. There's always the question uh -huh. of that which is unpredictable, yes. and That's that true. which you cannot see. So we say, 
that Pelosi could not be, and I'm in agreement. If I was a betting man, I I would agree mm -hmm. with that for today. But this situation is that look, with the first whistleblower, now there's a second whistleblower. Now that these people know that they have the cover prov being provided to them by the committees in the Congress, I predict this much that there may be a third and fourth whistleblower. Right, and with true. additional information, we don't know what the outcome might be. <laughs> well, well, but mm -hmm. a, a quick response, Adimu, to that. The only point I'm really kind of making is this. News has bec have, have become like agents of anxiety. I mean, you don't even know what they're saying is true. It ain't like that. It ain't like, you know, uh, I remember a few months ago when they were saying, what was uh, uh, Trump's lawyer's name? Penn? Cohen. Oh, Cohen. Cohen. Right. Oh, Co that Trump had told Cohen something about that. And then everybody on, on, on uh, CNN and MSNBC blasted it. And then the, uh, Mueller came out and said it's not true. We don't know what's mm -hmm. true. They're agents of anxiety on both, <laughs> both ends. I, I, my, 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 again, my question is, so even if a Democrat wins, Oh, what, what, what have they done? No, you're right. Five okay. committees on impeachment. What about health care? What about the things we're talking about? What about the things we need? None of that's being dealt with. The, if it is a Democratic president, don't, don't you think the Republicans, every little thing, right. it started with Obama, but that ain't nothing compared to what you, you're seeing this back and forth. We're just spectators. Yeah. You need something to balance this. You have Fox News that represents the Republicans against the Democrats. You have MSNBC, which CNN. represents the Democrats against the Republicans. Then you got CNN trying to play a little bit of both, but clearly they're pro-democratic. Okay, liberal. All right. In the end, what do we walk away with? Now, if there were a private ballot, you would have 20 dissenting, but there's not going to be a private ballot. And so... We ain't got to be betting. We can calculate, Brother Ham, that they're going to hold the line. They're going to hold the line because he's at the head of their party. He don't care what the poll. The poll said he wasn't going to be president. Is he president? Okay. The polls have already said that he was going to fail in his first year. Well, he's going to be going on three, trying to get to number four. Impeachment, as you stated, Brother Ham is right, it really doesn't mean removal. And remember this part. His base has already signaled. If you do anything to remove Trump, oh, hell, there's going to be race war in this country. See, we're forgetting that part. And we're the first ones to be black and brown right. at the brunt of that. It don't mean we're defenseless now, right. but what it means is we're the first ones who already are suffering with right. this kind of madness. Right. So that's what we're getting out of this now, the angst. And see, look, we're so busy with the desire to remove Trump as the man and forgetting what sits behind the seat that controls the man, but this man is just bucking more than any other president, so he's different. However, in the end result, we are now making Mr. Biden the presumptive Democratic nominee against Trump when he hasn't won it yet, when Elizabeth Warren He's is leading, leading in all of the polls. Right. So she needs to jump out there and say, oh, maybe he do need to be investigated, not because of other countries, but now that it is known, we need to look into this, but it should just be given because we're doing the same thing with Mr. Biden that was done with Ms. Clinton. And that's very dangerous for American politics and the body politics of blacks in America. And what do we get coming out of these elections? Two so, th for so a couple of, couple, couple of things from the viewers, right? So DB4A, uh, blacks will lose the power we got trying to build a third party over many years. Let's continue to build up our power in the Dem parties. Dems already dependent on black votes and reps. Uh, Jeff Palin, go with a party that does not have my back, not me. Um, and then we got Lorenzo Smallwood. Our challenge as African Americans is that we do not know how to use the system. We keep running away from it. Where are we going? Talk, talk, but where and what are you going to do?
Tombs, I, that's interesting. This is kind of like a twofold question. And I want to go there because somebody mentioned about, you know, no third party. Um, and then you mentioned, let's start with this one first. You mentioned that what about health care, prescription drugs? What about the, the business of the people? Of the people. And, and, and uh, when Nancy Pelosi held her press conference this week, she talked about the business of the people. And, and I'm sitting up there, and I remember texting Reverend Sharpton. And I say to I, and, I, and this, and he mentioned this the other day on his radio show. You know, same thing you mentioned with the business of the people. How do you get the the business of the people and get the Republicans to work and the president and all of them to work through with we going through this this whole process right now in Washington? And then the, my second question is, um, I go back to Ross Perot. You know, Ross, you met on the Ross. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and the whole situation with the Reform Party and trying to create that third party. Why, you know, how do we become successful? Because a lot of people, um, some they have the thoughts of trying to create that new wheel, but they don't know how to do it. So we have not successful third party, and are we there yet? I mean, I'm, again, I'm not saying we're scared, but it seems like right now we're so ingrained with the two-party system, I don't know how do we do this, where, like you said, Toombs, we may be behind the eight ball. You look at other countries, and they have eight, Five, ten six parties. parties. Exactly. Yeah. Right. But I know See, I threw a lot at you. No, but, that's, that's you know, no, no I, I think I digested yeah, Okay, all right. And I, and I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I, I want to respond openly, I mean, open with my response to uh, the, the uh, person uh, or, or the viewer who sent in the idea you can't do a third party. Right. All the time, you've only seen two parties. And I'm saying those two parties are no longer workable. It doesn't matter if it's a Democrat or Republican. The other side now will fight. And it started with Obama. Well, the first thing they said, we're not going to pass nothing. And fought. Now the bar is being lowered so far. And also in, the, in, in impeachment, remember, the judge is the head of the Supreme Court, who's a Republican. I don't think he'll be impeached. I just want to you know, address that. But even if he is, what is the mindset? It is, we've been Trumpmatized. It's bigger than Trump. And that's what we have to understand. But the idea of creating a third party, what I'm saying is you have to have alternatives. I'm not looking at the, it's like standing on a beach and you look at the wave that just came in. I'm not looking at that. I'm looking at the wave that's building out there. What's going to be the response if the Democrats win? from the Republicans. You got an unworkable system, situation, and to say that you can't do a third party, then what you're saying is surrendering workability. There's got to be something to balance. Now, one of the things about Ross Perot, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up, mm -hmm. what's interesting, he came out of nowhere, and he got 19% of the vote after he dropped out and came back. The country is ready for it, but it hasn't been tested, it hasn't been, it hasn't been provided. It's going to have to be a billionaire, unfortunately, someone that doesn't need money. That's the reality we're facing today. But the discussion has to begin. I don't have the answer, but like I said earlier, the beginning to understand the correct answer is beginning to understand how to ask the correct questions, Question. something the Democrats haven't done. One thing they, they were so hung up on why Trump won, uh, the Russians, his cologne, anything. My question was, why did Hillary lose? As the minister said, ahead of every poll, every Democrat was celebrating. How you lose? There's going to be a come to Jesus moment within the Democratic Party. My belief was Bernie Sanders was the correct nominee. The problem between Bernie and Trump is this. Trump realized at some point he was bigger than the party. Bernie never did. Bernie thought he was a player. And he, was, and he had a team. The Clintons were out, slit his throat, undermining him at every point. If Bernie had run and understood that, I think he would have beat Trump. And I think now he's missed his window. Now, and I want to send out a shout out. I'm sorry for his health. I hope, I hope he recuperates. Yes. Well, yeah. if they didn't skillfully maneuver him out, then he would have become the nominee. Yeah. And when they ran the polls, Trump said, and the Republicans said, if facing Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders, we want Hillary Clinton. She's an easy win. 
not Bernie Sanders. And so the Democrats helped all of that to take place. Mrs. Clinton couldn't get 300 people when she came to the Bronx at Lehman College. She couldn't get 30 people walking with her down the street. Bernie Sanders had 5,000, 8,000, 10,000 20, coming yeah. listening to him. So, and he had the best ideas at that moment. But look at the machinations that went in to help the Clinton family that didn't even deserve it. it ain't about being against them. They didn't deserve it. And because you wanted a woman. Okay, so it didn't happen. So now here comes Elizabeth Warren. Here, Warren. here comes Kamala Harris. Let's see what's going to happen now. We were wonderful to have a woman running the country. My concern is the hidden hand behind it all that must be destroyed, that's destroying black, brown, and poor white communities in this country. We can achieve a third party, but the Ambulance Muhammad says what you need is a political machine. And so you said it right. You need those to marry their wealth along with the oppression that's going on that we can now set up a third party. I just gave you an example a moment ago. You got Fox News for one, MSNBC for another, CNN for joining, so that's two against one. There's nothing for the people. We keep saying that everything is for the people. Our people, I'm almost finished, Jennifer, are suffering. And nothing is being changed to make our communities a decent and safe place to live. The blight is there. The gentrification is there. The removal of the banks is there. High crime, that is there. It's all existing, and nothing is being given. Now, we need to put something on the table, but I'm going to say to the Democrats, you know that you can't get in office without the black vote. What are you bringing so, to the table? So I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate the points that everybody is making. Hold it, the, the issue that I take with this, with this, the issue that I take with this, and I appreciate all the points being made, is... We're, you know, we're talking like, okay, so we're not being heard, and, but we're not even trying to be heard, right? Mm -hmm. I just, I, a few months ago, I spoke at the AKA convention. Uh, a few weeks late after that, I spoke at the Delta Sigma Theta uh, convention. In a few days, I'm going to speak at 100 Black Women's Convention in Atlanta. And each time, I'm asking these, these women, in aggregate, we're talking about 400, 500,000 people, right? I'm not even beginning to get into these other sororities and fraternities. The Boule, the Lynx, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, right? The Jack and Jills, all of these social clubs, organizations, the churches, right? The mosques, all of that. Are we collectively organizing? Are we, you know, are we coming together and saying, what are our issues? <clears throat> Kamala Harris, let's just use her as an example. She's an AKA. So the AKAs all want to get behind her because she's one of their own. Have they sat her down and said, these are our five issues? Mm -mm, no. What are you going to do about it? We don't know if, what they, have, if? We don't know if what? they have or not. We, we, well, what we do know is that they have not come out and publicly made a statement about exactly. these are the issues that we've told her we're concerned about, and this is how she's responding. We do know that when she first came out and said she was running, they all just got right behind her, and nobody was saying, well, what do you, what do you think about this and that, right? Publicly, we saw none of that. My very point is that we already have all of these organizing bodies that aren't even, I agree with you, third party would be what we need to do. But we can't even organize with the groups that we already have to challenge and ask the question. We're so quick when we see a, Cor a, a Cory Booker, when we see a Kamala Harris, and dare I say, when we saw Barack Obama, we were so quick to go, you know what? You look like us. Right. Right? So we're just going to get behind you. <coughs> we're not asking the questions. Well, Obama, I, I, you're I, I, oh, sorry, I, I, I think that one day in America, we will have a third party, but it's not going to be before November of 2020. No, definitely not. <laughs> we know that. Why. We, we, have we haven't even had the discussion. Now, now <laughs> one, one of the reasons we don't have a third party is because our political and legal system is not structured to accommodate a third party. Third parties... And, and, and we, could, we could right now form a third party. The question is, can we form a third party influential Texas. enough mm -hmm. to, in fact, win elections? And that's what's not happening in America. And it's not happening because we have a winner-take-all system. 
the two parties have in fact collaborated or yeah. some people might say conspired to structure the laws in such a way that the bars are so high that it would be Im nearly impossible for a third party to actually accumulate well, how did Perot, a, 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 how did Perot, how, well, well, how did Perot, how to, was to Perot, to, how did he manage to get where to, he got? To actually, the bars are set so high that a third party cannot accumulate enough power to actually win elections. Because in the final analysis, you create a third party to win elections, because that's the only way you get a representative in the legislative body to, in fact, push your agenda. Mm -hmm. Now, in Canada, our northern neighbor, in Mexico, our southern neighbor, in England, our eastern neighbor, France, Germany, and so on, they have a different kind of system. It's called a parliamentary system. And if a third party can, in fact, get at least 5% of the vote they are entitled to representative in parliament. So there, in those countries with a parliamentary system, they are structured in such a way so that people, but I, I, I add this cautionary note, even in the parliamentary system, the rich somehow mm -hmm. still control. So I just say that to say that I'm, you know, ultimately we will have a third party. And, and, and I can't predict how that's going to come. And I, when I say a third party, I mean a third party that can successfully sure. contend, contest for power. But in the meantime, the primary objective, number one, must be to win this election in 2020, must be to get Trump out. The people's agenda, for the most part, comes forward through the prime, the Democratic Party primary process. And that agenda is foremost represented by Bernie Sanders. He is the candidate that has said Medicare for all. He is the candidate that has said a national minimum wage of $15. He is the candidate that has said abolish student debt. Mm -hmm. He is the candidate that said we must have free college. All the others followed Bernie Sanders. And if people are really serious about the people's agenda, come hell or high water, they will continue to represent Sanders, not because he's Sanders, but in fact because he bears the standard of the people's well, agenda. Well, two, two points on that. First of all, your last point, I'll deal with that first. I absolutely agree. Bernie Sanders set the template for what we're talking about now with the Democrats. But my point is, he missed his window. And now he only had Hillary to contend with. So he looked much more sharper against Hillary. Now he had 23 people who were singing his same song, hmm. but tweaked up, brother. Elizabeth Warren is singing Bernie Sanders, but she put strings and horns on it. Wow. Now, Bernie now you does she's not doing shine through like he you did. Say, you saying she's doing a cover of Bernie? No, she's doing a remake. <laughs> remake. <laughs> <laughs> but a bit of there you yeah. go, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who better to say that than that two men? Yeah. Strings and all. Come on now. Bernie broke that mold, man. Bernie, <laughs> all, everything the rest of them are talking about is Bernie. But he missed his window, brother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what they're singing is a more refined version of his demo. Right. Now, let's start there. Now, let's go back to third party. I'll start with the last first. Look, man, don't keep, we got to stop saying what we can't do. That's the problem. But that's I never a, said no, we I couldn't. Didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't finish either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't finish either. <laughs> I said, let's stop right. talking about what we can't do. I said, because the, 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 the discussion has to be started. Nobody arrives at a conclusion without a necessary discussion. But and the, the real, discussion has been going on for 100 you. years. I, ne I never interrupted you. <laughs> Just allow me the latitude of completion. I never interrupted you. All right. Now, all I'm saying is I get tired of us, not you, us, always talking about what we can't do. Just like the brother who, who tapped in and mm -hmm. said, can't do a third party. Right. No, we got to start the discussion. Right. And no one can tell me how come Ross Perot got in a race, dropped out, and still got 19% of the vote. Let's remember, Bill Clinton was elected because of Ross Perot. Right. Not the loss of the Bush, because mm -hmm. Ross Perot took away the Bush, the Bush numbers. But I also said, if we remember, remember earlier, Minister, mm -hmm. I said yes. it'll be a billionaire. 
That's right. Who has the right heart and, and the right motives. Now, I don't know where that's coming from, right. but it ain't going to be no poor person. It's got to be somebody with enough money that they don't need money. Right. Now, <laughs> oh, no, no, forget that. <laughs> but you, you, you dig what I'm saying? I just, hmm. That's all I wanted to say. So, just is that... a question. Just a question. Just so, um, yes, for um, Tume and, uh, and, and Larry, right? So, today um, was the anniversary of Fannie Lou Hamer being mm. born. And so uh, you can just share light with our viewers out there because um, she tried to bring apart a third party in the 60s, but did it try it within the Democratic Party. Yeah. Um, and we've actually seen that, um, you know, whether it's moderate, conservative, we saw the Tea Party, how they put it in there, and you're yeah. starting to see the, the rise of the, the Democratic Socialists out there. So wh what can you share about that time period? Briefly. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Fannie Lou Hamer tried to create the Mississippi, well, did create, not tried, created the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. But the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party was not contending as a third party. The Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party contended within the primary system. And Fannie Lou Hamer sat in at the Democratic Convention that was held in Atlantic City, in New Jersey, in 1964. She sat in at the boardwalk. And she sat in to protest the mainstream Democratic, the mainline Democratic Party, because they had seated an all-white segregated right. delegation. Mm -hmm. The Mississippi <coughs> Freedom Democratic Party was a racially integrated political party that was contending for power within the primary process. And that's really how political factions in the United States contend. They don't contend like in the parliamentary system in the general election. They contend with each other, they contest each other within the primary, within the primary process. Right. So you got different tendencies within the Republican Party, they fight it out in their primary, and you got different tendencies within the Democratic Party, and they fight it out in their primary. And, you know, that's the system that we have here in the United States. And I, you know, I agree with two, look, I'm the, I'm one of the few people you will meet that actually ran as a third party candidate. I ran for the General Assembly against Republicans and Democrats That's in right. New Jersey in 1989. You know, I've been involved in, in third party efforts. People have been trying to create third parties. The discussion has been going on for 100 years. And there have been third parties which at some point to a greater or lesser degree had a little bit of success. Even Eugene Debs, after they put him in jail, Eugene Debs, the, the railroad man, the railroad mm -hmm. organizer, organized unions, he got a million votes from his jail cell. But in the meantime, over the past 100 years, the two main parties have colluded to create legal obstacles that make it almost impossible. The number of signatures you got to get, the, the, the amount of money. Look at, look at yeah, the, they look changed at the, the game. Right. Look at the, de the debates. Right. Mm -hmm. you, they, yeah. they don't put all the candidates on. They say, well, only you, which has raised, you know, a million dollars from 21 different states, yeah. you can be in it. You know, that's really undemocratic. Well, but that's. I just want to say in honor of Fannie Lou Hamer, mm -hmm. we need to bring back to life fully in our time her double negative. Mm -hmm. I'm sick and tired of being, of being sick and sick tired. And tired. Yeah. I just want to jump in here real quick, and, uh, and then we uh, we we'll move on. Something that you said, M. Tume, and uh, most of the panel agreed about having that conversation about that third party. And a lot of our listeners, I keep seeing they put up reparations, and the same thing like reparations. You want that conversation, you know. You want reparations, but we got to have that conversation. So the same thing with the well, third yeah, party. You got to be open for things, you know, because if the, the, you see that this system is not working totally for us as a people. So at the end of the day, you know, I look at that. Well, By the way, Mike, Mike, Mike. Your microphone. <laughs> you need a microphone. Under your paper. <laughs> there you go. By the way, the, the issue of reparations is now pending before Congress. Yeah, I mean, I, I got that yeah. Kanye's was doing that. As yeah, a study. Yeah, as a study. study. Yeah. It's years. pending as a study. study no, exactly. It, it, but I'm sorry. Yeah, but I, um, I want to, to say this because, you know, I, I hear a lot of people and some people, I, I'm not saying they're scared. Maybe it's not the proper thing to do, but I'm going to bring it up. Yeah. I'm going to bring it up because you both were right. And, you, and, and I said this to you, Larry, about the blueprint by Bernie Sanders. But now 
we got another situation there. That heart attack. The age. I'm it's, going there. I'm real. not going to sit here and play myself like the age is not a, 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 a issue. Now, I'm not saying that age stops you. I'm not using that as a crutch because I would be wrong. I see Jennifer look up at me. I'm not using that. But now I'm looking at the situation. Bernie, you had a heart attack. How will this affect you moving forward? And I'll be honest with you, a week from this Tuesday, it honestly is really going to be the telltale sign for Bernie Sanders. I don't know if it's going to go through. I don't know. He has the money. He's raised the most money out of all of the Democratic candidates now. I don't know. He has that ground support. He has a strong ground support. But right now, we have to look at it at, from a health point of view. Can he go through this rigorous? He even said this is a very rigorous uh, 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 running for president right. of the United States. So let me yeah. jump in here mm -hmm. before you all do. And I'm not really speaking to Bernie's platform, which is significant. And he speaks more to our issues than most. I just don't know. He's so progressive and so liberal. And you got conservatives who never want to see half of this stuff happen or a a, and a fraction of this right. stuff happened. Um, as somebody who was sick, deathly ill before, mm -hmm. right, who was at death's door um, and battled back right. uh, 10 years ago, diagnosed with cancer, bone marrow transplant, core blood transplant in February of 2010, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, not, didn't, like, literally did not work, did not come out of the house other than to go to the hospital for 15 months, right? I have now been back at it. Running my own, or running an organization for about seven, eight years, running around the country on a book tour, doing radio, right? All that. The minute I get a cold, or if I call and tell somebody, I just need to take a minute, just rest from it. Everything okay? You all right? My point is, in this, in this, where we are right now with uh, Elizabeth Warren, Biden. Trump and, and Bernie, right. all over the age of 70. That's correct. Age may not be as much the factor as somebody's health record. Now, the two often go hand in hand. But what I'm getting at is that it may not be age alone right. that people will look at Bernie and say, he can't do this right. because you got Trump. Right. Who's what, 74? You got, right, you got, you got Biden. Not older, than, not older than, you said who? Trump Bernie. Trump is what 74 72, 72. 72. Okay. He's not older than who? Okay. Bernie's 78. Yes, Bernie's 78. They're not the same age. Gotta hold the mic up I'm too. My long. point oh. my yeah, point Bernie's of all is that they're all over 70. Right. Okay. Right. right? Agree. And the point that I'm making is that what now kind of, you know, the the the, the decisive factor or the consideration here is more health and age and not just age alone. Because now he's had a heart attack, he will now be Scarlet Letter, somebody with a mm -hmm. significant problem, a major organ problem, right? That's what I'm just saying. Like, right. let's make sure that we don't look at it as just age. No, I, it's and, not I, and, age. I, and I said that, but mm. I'm saying that sometimes people are scared to bring up age. As you're talking about that, uh, you say like, that they, they may be right. Like, they may be up, but the oldest. bring it up for one. They got to bring it up for all of them. And that's I don't right. know I agree. if we're really going to go. I agree. There. That's my point. I agree, but because but, the front runners right now are all 70 and I agree plus. With, right. I don't think that Kamala's going to come from behind or Cory Booker or Pete Buttigieg or a, uh, you know, Beto know, O'Rourke. I'm saying do. simply because of age. Right. That's right. my point. Gotcha. And, and, and that's understood. But I just, I brought it up because it is a concern because even before Bernie had this heart attack, I sat there and said, you know, you have to be, you know, I look at a lot of folks that are up there in age that, can go through a rigorous um, uh, right, life yeah. that I'm like, you have to you know, be ashamed. People, there are you people have to that be, are you know. old, you know, that look old, right. and there are people that are old and youthful. Exactly. And look, man, I'm 72. Right. I'm not as youthful, right. but like I'm not 72 exactly. Exactly. that way. You know <laughs> right. what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, right. So I measure right. it like well, that. Also, yeah. we have to take into account a generational shift that's happening mm -hmm. within the Democratic Party. Right. Okay? You got the new. Bucks coming in, I call them, you know, with that fire and brimstone right. who are challenging the old heads. I think Pelosi and them been around too long, uh -huh. okay? And that's the reality. I'm not even talking about age. Yeah. I'm talking about amount of time, time spent. Right. It's time to make a shift. Right. And that's, and you feel in that. Look, the, I said uh, the Republicans had their come to Jesus moment mm -hmm. under Trump. 
Because it was going, are we going to go all in? Or are we going to say, this cat is crazy, he's out of nowhere? He broke all the rules. Right. And like, as the minister said, every poll. Ain't nobody sitting up here going to sit up here and lie and say, the poll said he was going to win. Even up to the night of the election. Right. Bottom line is, polls don't mean nothing. Hmm. I was going to say something else, but I know I'm <laughs> They don't mean nothing. Right. And we still, Sugar, honey, iced every tea. pundit yeah, right. was wrong. <laughs> they never apologized. Right. And they may be wrong again. Right. We have, what have we learned? Right. Oh, man. We, uh, uh, Dem I, I saw one poll, uh, Demu, where they said, any one of the first Democrats, six, six Democrats, will beat Trump. Get out of my... You know what I mean? Right. What do you mean? He's an incumbent president. He had 60 million votes. Not, you know, they all, the, the, the Democrats haven't been honest about, like I said, why the hell did we lose? First of all, obviously, she was the wrong candidate. Bernie didn't realize he was bigger than the party. He didn't take the giant step that Trump said, bring it to me. See, one thing about Trump, as you said, this ain't no regular cat. He's ready to rumble. And they haven't seen that. And he's, he's not doing boxing. He's MMA. And the Democrats see a Frankenstein, and they're trying to be a Frankenstein, but they ain't really that. And I'm saying we're coming to a head here. I don't know if they're going to win, man. I don't know. I, what, what do the polls mean other than somebody else getting paid? I want to get back to what you said, reparations. The Democrats have this habit of always teasing black people. Right. They'll hold it like, like, a, carrot. like, like a, no, a worm. Oh. Hell with a carrot. <laughs> a worm. Here, y'all. Right. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the, uh, reparations. What have you heard them talk about it now? They in the beginning, yeah, they brag about having black vote. Well, what other people would subject themselves to sitting back and watching some white people? I know we got y'all. Yeah. And right. black ain't the word they really want to use. That's right. Okay? That's right. I'm being kind on the show. Uh, uh, the uh, bottom uh, line is, why are we so mentally interwoven with the Democratic Party? I know the Republicans are out, but when they win, we standing outside the restaurant watching everybody because else. You got a lot of people that are passive that are selling that to us. That's, that's what. That's what's you're happening. Exactly right. and, we're, and we're scared to say. Yes, we're that's scared exactly to say. Right. We're scared it. to say. A lot of those, mm -hmm. and there a lot of our leaders are doing that. Most that's people. right. <laughs> and as I've said on open line, among the Democrats are conservative Democrats mm -hmm. who believe in the AR-15 rifles, who believe in carrying their guns, even though there's an established militia. They're Democrats, but they're conservative Democrats. That's why when President Obama was there, and he had both the House and the Senate, Brother Larry, yes. <laughs> made no progress. He cussed out his own party That's in right. his own political That's way right. because of the conservative Democrats right. that exist yes. that yes. help right Trump wing. to be mm -hmm. where he is party, and is going to maintain it. The House and the Senate. So in the end, what do we walk away with? So. The Democrats have reparations like on Bourbon Street when the whites hold a dollar bill on a string for young blacks to jump up only to pull it up for them never to get it. Mm -hmm. And I cussed them out and told them, stop that BS right now and ran them off their balcony. Right. And I said, stop with your mentality right. of reaching for something that don't belong to you. You want a dollar, you make a dollar. Right. Reparations does not need to be money. If it's money that's going to fix our condition, we don't need reparations. That's for Minister Farrakhan. I stand on this. We need land. And we need land with an outlet to the sea. Land that's minerally rich so we can grow for ourselves. We need to become more independent as a people. We need a black Wall Street back. Where right now the dollar in the black community, 1.3 trillion, 4 trillion, 5 trillion, does not last six hours in the black community across all studies. But when we had Black Wall Street, the threatening part of it was, is that the dollar circulated for six months. That's what we need to resolve that. So if you want our vote, put that on the agenda. How will you make Black Wall Streets in America that blacks will strive like a Chinatown, like a Koreatown, like Italians, and like other ethnic groups do. I totally agree. And we still have our part to do to yeah, make that yeah, yeah. happen yeah, in absolutely. the collective, right. but, but that, what will you do to help for that, that, this out of That's what I put on the table. It's, 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 it's really the last it's, round it's on this, le, so it's, less, on the amber. it's less about personality. Personalities is a part of it, but it's really about agendas. And Bernie Sanders represents the people's agenda. Now, what has happened is that in the last four years, 
the agenda, the overall agenda of, of the Democratic Party has been changed because now, just like him too may just said, all of them are trying to mimic Bernie Sanders' agenda. So if people are really keen about the agenda, they will stick with Bernie Sanders through the primary <laughs> process, not because it's Bernie Sanders, but because if you want Medicare for all, that's where you have to put your vote. If you want a national $15 minimum wage, that's where you have to put <coughs> your vote. If you want the abolition of student debt, that's where you need to put your vote. If you want free college, that's where you need to put your vote because then by pushing that, you push the party to support those things, not just during the election, but after the election. And people run for that nationally. So you get people in the Congress who are also for that, and then that eventually becomes legislation, and that legislation gets passed. It's, it's, it's a power struggle that's going on, but not simply for power, but for what will the agenda be? Biden has said clearly he does not support Medicare for all. The people need Medicare for all because people are going bankrupt trying to pay their medical bills. Yeah, but the question, Larry, yeah, real yeah. quick, is, is the Medicare for all, um, <coughs> and, and I see this with my wife. I see this. See, look, you, I, unless I'm, I'm you're looking at it with me, okay? You see, <laughs> that a lot of doctors don't get paid properly and this Medicare for all, you can't make doctors, you know, you, you keep saying it's Medicare for all, but at the end of the day, um, how are you going to sanction other doctors to make sure that they fall under this cap? So it's, it's, before it's, we even get to that, yeah, first of all, I, I agree. There's several questions. There's several. The amount of money, the tri the amount of trillions. I mean, he's got one figure. Elizabeth, Elizabeth's got another. But I, I want to get back to Bernie. I agree. He set the template. But I also emphasize he missed his window. And to keep bringing him up, he's already done, as far as I'm concerned. I think he's done. It's my personal my opinion. opinion. And but I know you know, but his agenda is not done. I, right. See, so it's I really that about point. the agenda. I just said that. It's no, not about the personality. It. But it is. In terms of, if, is he going to go, how far is he going to go? It's only personality. So if, he, if, it's about, if it's not about the personality, then, then, why is he on the debate? then you can go for Why is he debating? So, so you can't. Can. Why is he debating? No, if I'm, it's not I'm about going with Bernie because his agenda, okay. no, Warren's agenda is not the, no, oh, it is go, not. Okay. Okay. It is not the same as right. Bernie Sanders' agenda. They have two different, Warren is generally to the left in the side that the Bernie is on, but Bernie has the most progressive okay. agenda. Yeah. And she and so, she she's admitted to that. But I just want to say real quick to your question about how you can't mandating the doctors. Right, right. Look here, remember this. Doctors are indebted to the loans to get them to be where they are. Pharmaceutical companies yeah. run doctors in America. Right. <clears throat> they will give you a placebo <clears throat> Before they <laughs> placebo, um, that's right. Blood pressure medication mm -hmm. to test you, because once they get you on blood pressure medication, you can never get off of it. Right. Very next to difficult. You're on it for life. Pharmaceutical companies' profits go up in the air. Correct. So there's the, so Medicaid for all must be tampered must be tempered with how you handle the pharmaceutical companies that control the doctors that are peddling things that are peddling these things about vaccines there's one thing if you're dealing with measles why do i gotta get mmr measles mumps and rubella when four to one it makes young black boys autistic on the scale and young black girls after that and even white children so the bottom line is that's how you got to deal with that because of the pharmaceutical companies. And no one companies. has been able to check the well, pharmaceutical the companies well, this as is the of real yet. Well, this, yes. is, this, this is, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up, Minister, because right. th this is the issue that I've had with Medicaid for All. So the concept as a headline makes sense. People want to be covered with their health care, right? Mm -hmm. That to me is not the issue. The issue, as Minister pointed out, is how it works is so poor today. There, yes. Anytime you have multiple handoffs between doctors, um, yes. the, the lab technicians, the x-rays, the blood people, when you go to any doctor and you get tests done, you can get a bill from six to seven different places, right? The person who took your blood, the person who studied the blood, 
the person who took your x-rays, the person who did your MRI, the doctor who mm -hmm. saw you, the nurse. There are so many handoffs in there. It, the system itself is just so complex that everybody, and you just go to basic you know, business school, right, when you have your wholesalers and your distributors, if you have so many distributors, you have so many handoffs in that whole chain, it becomes expensive, it becomes um, corrupt, it becomes so many wrong things out there. That, to me, is what every politician, I've yet to hear any politician talk about, mm -hmm. how do you clean that up? Yes. Um, you know, to the point where mm -hmm. doctors have to uh, take out huge loans in this country to get their doctor's degree, so they're already in the hole. Mm -hmm. Then you That's have right. them being dependent upon right. all the equipment that they need that they have to use to a standard to actually ply their trade. Then you have the pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. as you talk about, mm -hmm. who we all know they spend so much money in R&D that they will, whatever they come up with, they charge like astronomical prices right, for it. Yes. So th there's something just inherently wrong with the entire system and that I don't believe Medicaid for all, that statement will yeah. solve it. Yeah. Right? That's right. And, and, I agree. And, and I you, totally agree right. with that. And you're not going to have the politicians bring it up because the pharmaceutical companies them. bankroll them. That's right. You're not going to have the commentators that have run the debates bring it up because their stations run pharmaceutical commercials. And you gotta be worrying about hormone growth, you gotta be worrying about hallucinations, jumping off the top of the bridge, all of this, but yet they run that for two to three minutes. And just to, just to echo your point, who, who admitted guilt this week? Chris Collins, and why he sat on a board of a medical company yes. that he had insider training on. So it just it just illustrates yes. your point, the level of corruptness that's in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, think, so we got to bring this up. We have to bring this to the forefront. That's right. So. Well, I'm bringing it to the forefront now. We need Medicare for all universal health care in this country. We cannot continue to go down this road. And I know that there are obstacles. I know there are challenges. I know there are technical difficulties. But if we can make a mission to Mars to put a colony on Mars, we can figure out how to solve our health care problems in this country. France, England, Germany, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Canada, Japan, all have national Cuba. Cuba, not Libya anymore. Obama yeah. sorted that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Cuba. <laughs> Cuba. All have nationalized health care systems. We need it here. And yes, there'll be problems, just like there were problems with Social Security when they first put Social Security forward. But they straightened them out. Ain't nobody saying we don't need Social Security. There were problems with Medicare, which only covers now people at 65 and up. There were problems with that, or if, or but they got sick. straightened out. Or if you sick. try to take Medicare, you try to eliminate so. Medicare for all, Social Security now, and see what an uproar you'll get from all right. sectors of the population. So, 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 let, let so me what just we quickly do? add. Let me just quickly add. I completely agree. I'm in complete agreement. But we also have to keep in mind that even with universal health care, whether it be Medicare for all or uh, one universal health care basic pay system like they're trying to push in New York State, that if we don't also continue to push on issues attendant to health, uh, health disparities, because health care alone is not going to solve okay. the disparities that persist in everything from infant and ma maternal mortality rates, right, being higher for black women, to higher hypertension and blood pressure, mm -hmm. higher breast cancer, all of these issues, you know, obesity, diabetes, all of these mm -hmm. issues that affect black and brown communities at higher rates. It's all a byproduct. It's not just health care. It's race, poverty, gender, yes. and environment. And so, you know, we've got this, this, this kind of myth that once we get health care, that's good enough. Uh-uh. No. As long as our communities, yep. you know, have higher pollutant yep. rates, as long as poverty is a stressor that causes breakdowns in the body mentally and physically, Healthcare alone isn't going to do it. And, I just and, need to put that and, out. And, and, and uh, you're, you're right. Exactly and, this right. Is, and this is what you battle. I got. I had a young lady reach out to me this week and said, "You know, does my wife go through this with this specific doctor on pain um, meds and and how the the pain management is and and these are the things that we had to fight. And when you're sick, 
I'll tell you this, and them two may and Jennifer, when you're sick and you're not feeling well, mm -hmm. it's very hard to advocate for yourself. Absolutely. So, you know, so I'm, I was there for my wife. I'm still there for my wife. But there's a lot of people that are sick that cannot even advocate. And there are doctors that come in that they're not even, um, they're not even sens sensitized to your pain. No. And when they, and, and let's add that when you are looking at black and brown people, yes. The, the, there's a lot of research out there that mm -hmm. shows the bias that exists yes. from the ER room yes. all the way to the operating room. They just look upon black and brown people differently. When I came down with leukemia, I woke up on a Friday morning with what I thought was a flu-like fever. Saturday, I'm in the ER. The doctors triage me and say it looks like a virus. Never test my blood. Wow. Right? Unheard of. And that then three days later had me in a coma mm. with the doctor saying I was going to die in Unheard two days. Of. But had they tested my blood. Now fast forward. By the time I go for transplant, now they've got my, they've got my, my record, right? right? Everything from, and we can say a whole lot of negative here. I'm going to jump in on this. But everything from Michael Bloomberg, because I'd worked in the Bloomberg administration, showing up at the hospital. So then it all of a sudden was, mm. well, who is she? Yes. Why is Bloomberg here? Yes. Elliot Spitzer coming, right? Yes. Who is this person, right. right? So now I get a different level of care <laughs> to when I get transplanted. And every time I went in for treatment after the transplant, mm -hmm. the nurses, you know, for, you know, for a transfusion of some type of other, the nurses, the attending people in making small talk. Oh, so you're an attorney. What type of law do you practice? Mm. Because somewhere on my record, at one of the most prominent hospitals in New York City, they had a little red circle or something mm -hmm. that said, alert, alert, alert. She's an attorney. Yes. The care looked very different right. because now I had some status and standing. Right. And that's I, what we and, have to pay and attention to. And I use that. I just want to say that. And I want to say this. I just want to say this. I use that. Absolutely. I have to use that with Reverend Sharpton. I swear yeah. to God, at Long Island College Hospital, I was having problems. And too, man, you know I would come in yeah. here and I'm upset and I'm having problems. I called Rev. I said, listen, blah, blah, blah. Absolutely wrong. He walked in there. When he walked out, they came flying in. I, What's wrong? What happened? So-and-so. Yeah. Next thing, that care is bumped up. Yeah. How they treat her. Then they made a, they did a procedure. They burnt her with a Demerol shot. Mm -hmm. And they burnt her with a Demerol shot. My wife told them, you have to do it intermuscular. They didn't wow. listen. They did not listen. They burnt her. They called us at home because we had a lawsuit. What do you want? You know what we took? We didn't take money. We took a doctor. There was a doctor that would take her under his wing. So now she had a private doctor instead of a service doctor walking in because when you got Medicaid and Medicare, you don't get a private doctor. You get the service doctor. So whatever doctor is rotating around, right. you get. But she had a private doctor. So when wow. he walked in that ER, he wrote. And when the ER didn't want to follow, when they changed the protocol, you know what he did? He bypassed the ER. He said, I'll send you through admitting. I'll admit you, and then I'll write your orders. So that's the game that I had to play wow. with Long Island College High School. See, those are examples that prove that's the rule. That, that's if you don't have those things, I, I, I'm just saying, just throw it in on a much yes. more minor level. Same experience. Mm. So I go in, they Google me. <laughs> the head of the hospital comes I forgot there. you oh, Google, boo. Uh, you know, <laughs> But it's the same thing, man. Same and if you ain't got insurance, brother, right. then your house goes when you're sick like we were. Okay. Oh, well, I am and you were. My transplant costs $1.6 million. I'm approaching. I'm approaching. Transplant $1.6 million. So if you ain't if got insurance. I didn't insurance, have insurance, I We haven't talked here. about that. Insurance. That's right. Yeah. See, and, 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 and secondary yeah. insurance. Well, that's right. $1.6 And that's another conversation because... When Colonel Abrams, and I just want to say this because we're going to switch up. Colonel Abrams, a musician, was suffering with diabetes. You right. got to realize a lot of musicians, they don't have health care. Right. And I remember Tony Herbert. Tony yeah. Herbert's trying, if, if, he, if he hasn't done it yet, created or trying to create something for DJs and musicians yes. so they can have health care because people get sick. Right. And to try to pay this... Colonel Abrams, before he passed, he was living in the streets. Uh, and then he got he got the hmm. care. Tony got involved. Tony Herbert, I got to give credit to Tony Herbert. He got involved, got to, um, um, uh, Colonel Abrams some health care, you know, and, you know, unfortunately he passed on. Uh, not Tony, but Colonel yeah, Abrams. Colonel Abrams. You know, but you're right. And that's something that we, you know, and that's why we, these platforms are very important to have this conversation. And now you see why we started this way today. 
on this morning because we got a chance to talk about Amber. Beautiful. But Bobby didn't get a chance. Larry didn't get a chance to talk about Amber uh, Geiker case. And, of course, this week we saw um, the guilty, uh, well, the sentencing. Well, no, the decision first. Let's start. The guilty murder charge against Amber uh, Geiker in the shooting death of Botham Jean in Dallas by former police officer uh, Amber Geiker. Um, then you had the sentencing process this week, and as you said, Jennifer, she could have been sentenced up. I, I read 99 years up to life, right. um, minimum, as you mentioned, two years. Um, the prosecutors wanted at least 28 years. That was the age of when um, Botham Jean was shot and killed. He was 28 <coughs> years old, so they wanted 28 years. And the jury came back, and there were two jury, ju jury members on Good Morning America this past Friday, and the black woman said that this case was different than the shooting of other black men. And I just lost it there. I, I just couldn't understand it. They sentenced Amber Geiker to 10 years where she's um, up for parole in five years. Jesus. You understand? So and then you had the whole situation. And, and like I said, I don't mix the repercussions of this man dying. He didn't get shot and live. You know, and as I mentioned on this on-air show, the family have the right to say, I forgive. How they want to forgive, that's on them. But what I question, and so many other people question, is we question the first thing is the, se the, uh, the number of years mm -hmm. that were handed down by the jury in this case. That's number one. And then the number two was the whole situation. And we, we don't want to make a big thing of it, but the whole process, we don't see this. We don't see where you see somebody um, on trial for murder of killing someone and seeing their family member hug them, hug them and just forgive them. And this young lady hasn't even done it. She, has, she didn't even do a day of time at the particular time to be forgiven for anything. But again, that's his right. But then the judge hands a Bible to uh, Amber and then hugs her and gives her certain words of comfort. That's where some people say that. Don't forget the bailiff. Right. Don't forget the bailiff. The bailiff is stroking. The judge's conduct was very, right. conduct was very right. inappropriate. But I want to get. You might, brother. So can can yeah, we yeah, just yeah, first yeah. begin with? Mm -hmm. um, probably want, all of us question the sentence. Uh, yes, I right? want to go. Yes. Let's just begin with: Have we all sat on a jury before? Yes. yes. So you know, I'm an attorney, and up until I guess maybe about maybe it was about eight to 10 years ago, attorneys in New York could not sit on juries. But then that they found, they found that they weren't having enough people who could uh, circle, uh, cycle through, so they lifted that ban. I sat on my first jury about two years ago, and it was a negligence case. The reason why this is important is that what I realized when I got in that room with uh, it was a it was a it was a basic negligence negligence case, and the person who had fought, who had brought the lawsuit against a company a store, was an elderly black woman. On that jury was majority white, and younger white people, and when we first got started deliberating, I'm just being very honest here, they couldn't make heads or tails of what the law was. They did not understand negligence, mm. and I realized I'm sitting there having a dialogue with them, and I'm now teaching them, you know, negligence 101, right? Tort law, negligence. My point is, I realized in that moment that that jury, whoever's got the persuasive abilities in that jury room, when they go into deliberation, that's what's going to come out of there. And so what we have in this situation, I don't know who all of those jurors were. Mm -hmm. Right, but how well they understood the law, coupled with their biases and their prejudices going in. So this was not just a the court what happened in that courtroom per se, but people were bringing in their own biases, how they view, in my opinion, white women in America, how they view black men in America, mm -hmm. and we don't know who was in that jury room, who was really like kind of driving the conversation and what resulted. Right. Yeah, I just think and it's that's a good point. Good point. Uh, to to a me, point. That, that's a that profound is, point. Yeah, you know, having, having sitting sat 
in jury pools. I had that same revelation, and <laughs> not to be funny, but I remember telling myself, this is a reason why I never want to come close to committing a crime, because if they say that you are judged by uh, a jury of your peers, mm, yeah. most of these people in here, they were not my peers. Yeah. They didn't <laughs> understand basic things. Right. They're, they're, the vast majority are about, I want to get out of it, or this is allowing me to, 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 to get paid and not have to go to work. And I mean, so all, I mean, and, and just to really pay attention to things. And then when we go to deliberate, and I was a, uh, I was a backup juror. And so um, just to hear some of the early conversations, um, it just caused me to say, wow, because people's biases were coming true, right? You know, it was a case around, um, you know, a, a police a police car going through a red light and, and hitting another car, and, and people immediately said they're guilty without hearing any of the facts around this. And I'm like, but you just told the lawyers that you would not be biased with things. So I, I, I get all that. The, on the bottom, Gene, the thing, I, I like what you said, Fatin, because I agree with you, right? I, I am not going to judge the, the family, right? The family has a right to express the way they feel about it. They're the ones who lost a loved one. Right. And if their faith is so strong that they can forgive what happened, more power to them. They are a better uh, family than, than I am. Um, I would be in sense knowing that somebody walked into my house when I'm sitting, you know, my loved one sitting on their furniture, watching television, eating ice cream, and they get shot. And then for her and this Texas Ranger who testified to basically say, uh, once again, we've heard this all the time, well, she followed what her training taught you. Again, if that's what her training taught her, something is seriously wrong. Her powers of observations were so off. How do you walk to your door where you live and not notice a mat outside the door, a red mat, right? You would know that, right? You walk in, your furniture, unless they bought their furniture at the exact same store and rearranged it the right way, as soon as you walk in, you know, we have all have been in situations when you walk in your house and something's off. Right. You just know something's off. Right. And then for her, the first thing she does is pull her gun while he's sitting at, at the couch and he stands up and she says, show me your hands and then fires. No weapon. There was no claim of she saw a weapon, that he rushed her or anything. And then her training, by the way, mm. means that if the door was open as she claims it was, and you believe someone's in there who shouldn't be in there, you don't go in. Right. You stand outside and backup. you call for backup. Right. You're a cop. She didn't do any of that, right? She did none of that. And so, you know, Pickett, you, you talked about this on sure. the radio side which is how the Dallas police take no accountability for it is beyond me. When they were testifying and the Rangers, they got the Rangers to testify that she was following her procedure, the procedure that the Dallas police taught her. So they are culpable in this as well. Indeed. And, but it goes to and the Mike Pickett, Mike, Pick with, with, Mike, Mike. Mike. Okay. And, and they're going to be hit with a large, large, uh, of, uh, damage claim. No question about it. But it uh, goes to the, back to life. Right. Yeah. It goes to the indoctrination of the jurors and the judge. When we had the John White case here in New York City mm. Mm. and came to his aid. To give a little the, back, the, the background. The backdrop of John White was that his son Aaron White was at a party. African American. Black. black. This is a black family mm -hmm. that used to live in Miller Place in Suffolk County. Long Island. And he had friends that were white, friends that were Hispanic, friends that were black. And he was accused of saying something toward a white girl that he had not saw, did, right. done. And the white... What year was this? This was in 2009. Uh, oh, I thought it was 1955. 2009. That, no, sir. This is in this century. No, I know 2009. what it was. It's the same yeah. story, though. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and the white friends of the white girl came to his father's home, to his home, in the wee hours of the night and threaten, beckon for him to come out. And if you don't come out, we're going to come in and we're going to rape your mother. If you don't come out, we're going to come in, we'll kill your father. So Mr. John White comes out as a homeowner who he could have come out with a shotgun, but he felt that would be too overpowering. <laughs> and he came out with another kind of weapon. And the weapon's safety was off. 
but he was at a distance. And one of the young uh, white boys said, you skinny little nigga, pardon my expression of the use, you can't do nothing with that, and charged him. And the gun went off, and the boy was then shot. Not that John White shot at him, but he challenged him by calling him the N-word, that you ain't worth nothing. And then they took 45 minutes to get to Mather Hospital, which was just 10 minutes away. And as a result, the boy died. Mm. But yet they held John White responsible. Now, he goes to trial. Those whites that were there, some of them skinheads, they say, they were all coming to the trial. John White had maybe three, four people. Her, his attorney came to me, said, Minister, I think you and the nation, y'all should get involved to help this black man. I met with John White at his home. We took on the case. We showed up with 2530. Wow. Then they all went home and took off their suits, came back with tattoos on their heads, talking about the MMA fighters, and we said, well, we're jujitsu specialists and tai chi <laughs> and karate, so it don't make a difference. So whichever way you want to go, we can go. And right. so everything took place. Mm -hmm. Here's the point. When the case was ratified, the jurors came back with a guilty verdict on a high end. Judge Barbara Kahn, who looked at me the entire proceedings, because I was there every day for the case. Um, and, and it was almost a fight when the verdict came in. Because this is what happened. Judge Barbara Kahn said, no, that verdict is too high for the threshold of what I heard. The jurors now voted for a high threshold for him to be in prison. She said it's too high. So I think it was nine to 15 years. She brought it down from one to three. So the family went off and they jumped up out of their seats and the father was right there with me. And I said, just jump. I, I mean, I've been waiting for something mm -hmm. because y'all have been here arrogant against this black man. And it was your son that caused his own death, mm -hmm. but you won't recognize that. So they asked us to stay inside, me and FOI. We did, and the family was escorted out. Here's my point. Judge Barbara Kahn saw that it was too high and lowered it. Unless there's some law in the state of Texas or Dallas, what was it that the judge who had so much empathy for this Dallas police officer, no objectivity at all, that you would not see that what the jurors came back with was not sufficient for a man, but he's a black man who's been assaulted. He did nothing to no one. He's dead forever. You can talk about heaven and the hereafter or the afterlife. Right. He's not here in this life. Right. He will have no wife. Right. He has no children. Right. He has no progeny. He leaves a mother who's leaving Dallas. And she said the corruption is here. He has a brother who has a sympathetic heart. But he's going to learn that forgiveness must be earned. You have the right to do what you want, but you're going to learn it needs to be earned. She never apologized. She lied on the stand to justify what she did. And there's more here than meets the eye. So the judge did not have objectivity. And here's the story that Dr. Muhammad taught us of a black man and a white man having an accident on the highway. They argue with each other, cuss each other out then depart from one another. Then the black man goes to his blue collar job. He's a janitorial engineer and he goes and he takes care of the building. And the white man goes into his office building and the court officer says, your honor, here are your robes. <laughs> and when the justice, he goes to sit on the court. Remember when you put on the black robe, Minister Farrakhan taught me the blackness represents darkness and the opening that comes up means your head represents light amidst the darkness that you judge with balance and fairness. So the scales of justice is an inanimate object that cannot see or hear or touch, but the human being can. So because of this argument with the black man, another black man comes in front of him that he should have gone let go free. He gives him one to three years, three to six years because of the incident with the prior. What was it with this judge that she, I'm going into her mind, that you would now not give her a Bible? I don't care if it's a Bible, Quran, or Torah. Why would you? She was convicted of murder, yes. not manslaughter, not second degree, murder. murder. So you now, you ain't got a scrounge at her. 
but deal with her accordingly. And what black man have you hugged? What black woman have you hugged? Our sister down in, in Alabama who was thrown down by the officers and they on their clothes taken off her body. She, Chiquita uh, 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 Simmons, she, she has to go to court and look at facing time. Judge, you didn't hug her there? So let me, let me just interject here, and I'm going to say I completely get where you are, and I've been doing a lot of this all morning, agreeing with you all. Mm -hmm. I also, and I'm speaking right now from my faith, right? It's just important for me to get this out here. I hear what you're saying, and, I, and, 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 and I'm, I'm not going to argue with what you're saying. I do believe that people can hold two truths. Mm -hmm. And I do believe as a person of great faith, as a person who, and I'm going to be just put it right out there, right? Like we were talking earlier about health and well-being, right? Mm -hmm. Or, and, and the need for healthcare and all that. I was given a 99% chance of death. The doctor said I was going to die on, uh, uh, on, on Wednesday. They diagnosed me on Friday. They told my husband I was dying that weekend. Indeed. Right. I did not die. And I believe Thank that God. it was faith and prayer. And I believe, and, 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 and I believe God was working God was and working. people medicine. Were, and medicine, but <laughs> faith right. without right. works is dead. Right. That's the right. point that I'm making, and this is not about me, but the point that I'm making is that my faith tells me that sometimes there are intervening circumstances mm -hmm. that will take situations that people should say should go like this, X, Y, and Z, and then A, B, and C, or that one plus one equals two, and it should be just the way that it is. And sometimes there are these intervening circumstances and forces that overcome you and Indeed. that create a different dynamic. Indeed. So no, do I, I mean, like, did the, did the judge do what she should have done? Did she step out of line according to what her, you know, what, 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 what you know, what, what wearing the word, robe suggests that she should do? She did something that, according to what we've read, she'd never done before. But I don't know her faith and her faith walk that tells her in that moment when she sees a brother, the brother of the victim, forgive with his heart. Mm -hmm. What compels her in that moment to put down her robe and step up and said, I'm not going to let the robe and the justice, because my allegiance is maybe not to this law in this moment or to this court, but maybe my allegiance is to my God. Mm -hmm. And so I got to put this down and I'm going to show love and mercy too. But I don't know. All I'm and, and again, I right. may have a different opinion here because I do believe you can hold. Please. But, 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 but uh, Jennifer, but, the, the, the issue I have, yeah. is, and, 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 and I know Bobby, okay, I'm going to go. I have to go to Covered Game. Yes. I'm sorry I have to leave here now. It's always a pleasure. Giants, giant game. Giant game. Got to do that duty over there. Um, I agree with this, that you can hold two faiths out there. Um, and what moved her, we'll never know. What caused that jury to give 10 years, we'll never know because we were not in there. Um, again, I just echo that this was shining a light on a police department where police reform uh, we've talked about it before, should be one of those agenda items. It, it has to be one of those agenda items for them to continue to get away by saying, well, they followed procedure. They're not bad people. Okay, they're not bad people. You got bad procedures. And to change things, you got to seriously look at those procedures and change them. So uh, keep a good thought. And I'll see you next week. All right, Bobby. Sounds All good. Right, I want to respond back to Jennifer now. So the, the, the issue, the issue that I have, and I heard what you're saying, and I'm not saying you're wrong because that you're really summarizing, and you don't know what what happened. And I, I will respond to Bobby because the two jurors did speak. But my thing is, I remember when I was wearing my white jalabia on for Juma on Friday, mm -hmm. and I know that. If I dressed like this, mm -hmm. if you didn't know my faith, if I turned around and looked at a young lady, I was just doing what an average brother does. I'm not saying nothing, just turn around my head and just keep on going. But when I wore that white, I know that I just, I, I, I represent myself, but I represented something bigger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that if she wanted to do that, she was still 
in that room because he even was caught off guard. But if that's something that you wanted to do, I think there was a time and a place for it, not in that courtroom. Right, but not sometimes the spirit, I guess my point is I understand. But we saying. always, we as a people <laughs> of <laughs> okay, color, Jennifer. we as a people of color are always giving, uh, it's always some, and it's not, I, I'm just only saying, this is how a lot of black folks are feeling because we are behind the eight ball all so much that it seems like we all the time are behind the eight ball that we always have to have an excuse. I hate to bang like that, but we have an excuse. I'm not excusing. No, that. I'm not That's saying, but we excusing. have, no, what I'm saying is we oh. always have, when I use the word excuse, explanation. I use that as a better word. What? But we I'm not always even, I don't know her explanation. Right, but you, but you, right, you don't know but you said, I don't know what move, and this may have a bigger purpose. But the bottom line is ethics. That was wrong. That was wrong, and I'm calling it what it is. It was wrong. It was wrong what she did. Black, white, wrong. And if I just said, I actually said you can hold two truths. The test. I said that it might, it, that, that according to the law mm -hmm. and proceedings in court. Right. That was wrong, yeah. but that sometimes your higher calling mm -hmm. right. propels you to step out right. mm -hmm. and do something differently, but, but this holding is why, two truths. But this that's is all why, I'm saying. But this is why in the United States we have separation of church and state. state. Right. And that's why I support separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. The test becomes... And I didn't mean to bang that table. That was it, that. The, <laughs> the test becomes <laughs> if this behavior was exhibited by numerous judges, mm -hmm would it be acceptable? Or had the judge been a Muslim and come down and given a Quran to the defendant, mm. would people have responded in the same way? So this is why I understand, I, I agree with the philosophical argument you made about two truths, but at the same <coughs> time, this is why we have laws, mm. so that people can behave in a certain way, and and I do think that that was inappropriate because, yeah. right. it, you, if you invert the argument, and had it been the other way around, and Botham Jean was alive and Amber Geyer was dead, mm -hmm. and had the judge done the same thing, would we say that was it? No, we'd all be arguing in here. Mm -hmm that that was not appropriate. Right. Right. So so it wasn't, you know, I, I understand. Right, right. Right, right. This right. is, that's, this is this, that's exactly what I'm saying. This is why I'm, they talk about the kind of deportment yeah. a judge must have. And you you in your in your metaphor mm -hmm. about the robe and the head coming mm -hmm. out of the robe and the light, you know, the judge plays yeah. a particular role and, my response, and must stick to that role. And my response to it, Jennifer, is He's that... well aware of his role, too. Well, we support her mm. as a judge, as a woman that's on the court. As a right. black woman. As a black woman that's on the court, <laughs> without a doubt. However, mm. if you were going to do that because you represent something bigger than yourself, you should have done it privately. In her chamber. So all I'm going to say to, to the, I'm gonna, what I'm going to yes. say to the to the I, I wasn't finished, yeah. well let me just, let me just say to the seven of us. Let me just say this. Mm -hmm. And again, I say my sister did a master. You know the show Master, not Master TV. Um, Ted Koppel used to do a show Nightline. Uh, Nightline. Nightline. Six part series before there was social media, reality TV, mm -hmm. highest uh, rated show of all times of all TV uh, TV shows, uh, uh, news news programs, and it shadowed her in New York City public schools as a master teacher for one year. Mm -hmm. She got a lot of criticism. She a lot of people writing in about what she did wrong, what she should have done better, what she should have done differently, and I'm going to say on this on this show to each and every one of us. Let he is without sin cast the first stone. I'm going to say to each and every one of us that in our respective roles, mm -hmm. professional and personal, I'm sure that each and every one of us at one point or another has done something that others would, be, would deem inappropriate because we were caught up in the moment. I'm just, th there's not one of us sitting here mm -hmm. Who has not done one thing in our roles that somebody could not sit and say, ooh, but according to the book, you were to have done it 
in such and such a way, mm -hmm. and you were to have been perfect. Yeah. So this is so not. So let me interject, Jennifer, mm -hmm. because I, I. I'm sorry. Not no, no, no. I just... understand. Yeah, because that's not where I'm going, and that's not where I think. Take, take your moment. That's not where I'm going, and that's not where I think we should go. It's not about sin. I'm no. I'm just using that as an. No, I know. I know. I know. But even as an analogy here, she should have just made a better decision. Mm -hmm. You're a judge. You have chambers. You can do whatever you want to do in your chambers. Before you take her to the jail, bring her here to me. Okay. That's all we're saying because you represent something that's right. bigger. That's it. Okay? And it's not proper that that's done. So if now a precedence is set now that, well, I got caught with the spirit, that I want to now do this in the court and do that in the court, then the uprisings take place. Now, no one is really going to complain because here's the other side. She's a black judge. But the, the, if it was, let me think, if it was a white judge, whole different reality inside of America. But she's a black judge. So I don't want us to jump on her so much that we, let me finish, that we castigate her because she has value, she has service. We just feel it could have been done better because of the whole that you represent. Now, would you say that if, if that was a white judge? Would I say what? Would you say the same thing? That it was wrong? Of no, course. No, what you just said, that we should no. value her and all that? Or are we doing that? We should value. Judge. I don't care who, I don't care your color. Don't care. That's what I'm asking. It's, it's That's not about your color. If you're right. right, you're right. Right. I don't care your color right. or your complexion. Right. You understand? I agree with you. Let me finish. Let me finish. And, 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 and everybody knows the nation and what we represent. Yeah, we got one minute. We're not caught down. up on that. Right. So, so all I'm saying is, is that Minister Farrakhan said this in reference to the spirit of atonement. Hope we'll make that announcement before we leave the program today. Right. But... I think you might make that announcement in a minute. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. we need to do it right now? Yeah, we need to do that Well, right we now. let you know that next Sunday is the... Uh, 21st and 24th anniversary of the historic Million Man March. Yes. Minister Farrakhan will be speaking live from Christ Universal Temple in Chicago, and we're going to be hosting it here in the East Coast in New York at Muhammad Mosque number seven. You can call us at 646 583 3977. That's 106 08 West 127th Street, Mount Pisgah in Brooklyn, 212 Tompkins Avenue, dial 718. Um, 342 1900 and in New Jersey area, Muhammad Mosque, number 25 973 624 5532 for New Brunswick, Plainfield, Trenton, and Newark. And tune in. But Minister Farrakhan said these words even though there's eight steps to atonement and there's six, five before you get to number six, which is forgiveness, he says, sometimes you have to come in the process with forgiveness already in your heart. To forgive the person who's offended you. Well, l l let me just add a comment to uh, As a judge. your earlier comment about mm. about the judge. There are certain standards that judges are required to maintain. Yes, sir. And uh, one is the essential neutrality. Hurt, walking down and hugging and kissing that that young lady was not uh, evidence of any kind of neutrality at all. Um, she may she may get some sort of uh, admonition as, as a result, but she should, she should not have done that at all, oh, period. Yeah. And, and let me just say, before we leave, the sentence was outrageous. 10 years was outrageous. Wow. Right. You know, I think it, we it, all agree. It, 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 it was, it right. was and, and one more example mm. of institutional racism in the criminal justice system. No, and, I, I just, and I speak as a yeah. former judge, too. I understand. I just, okay. just want to say this. That. Yes, I just want to say this. You know, first of all, I thank the panel. I thank Jennifer. I thank... Uh, Brother Mtume and, and the minister uh, and can for I just say coming this? on over. Please follow me at A Hafiz M A H A F E E Z M on all media platforms. God bless you. All right, my brother. And I just want to say that Jennifer said something that is very important because um, if you look back in in life, mm -hmm. a lot of those moments that you just mentioned, Jennifer, um, that things have changed or affected people's lives. Um, have been done through those moments. Um, but also, um, other people have also been affected mm -hmm. on the other side of it. It's, it's a thinking process. It's a process that we as a people of color, we still continue to, 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 to fight 
and struggle here in America, a, a place where we were slaves. Our ancestors were slaves, and we still get treated, you know, because of not our character, but the color of our skin. So we, as a people, struggle as a people, as we struggle as a society. Right. But with those words, you know, uh, Brother M. Tumay, good to see you. Right. Good to see you. Good to see you. Can I just say one final yes. point, right? Because one of the things that I seek to do along with Bobby is just to see what's, you know, what people are saying. Mm -hmm. And um, there are several people who are questioning my blackness. Mm -hmm. uh, there are several people who are questioning uh, whether or not I'm a woman who's apologetic for all other women, and black women in particular. And um, people can Google me if they like. Uh, I'm a very proud, strong black, black woman. Yes, uh, and I'm a very proud, strong black woman with my own mind. Yes. And if, you know, if my opinions cause you to wonder whether I'm black, enough, maybe you need to question what it means to be black and an intellectual and someone who thinks critically. That's right. And I've said this before, and I say it to Jennifer <laughs> again, and me and him too, maybe we talked about it, that we didn't bring someone on here that doesn't think and speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. We said that. And I said this time to you, Jennifer, it's going to be times when we disagree. Absolutely. And, no, and, yeah. and, 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 but you we do it with respectfully, <laughs> but yeah, it's going to be times. Do not challenge so, my blackness. But anyway, I'm, I'm giving the sign that we have to wrap up. I'm a producer too, so I know that I must in this, but I want to thank right. everybody, and we are uh, and thank thankful you, that thank you for thank inviting you. me, brother. Thank, thank you. You're thank welcome. Thank you for having us on. You're thank you welcome. for coming. Thank and you. Right, until next week. And we love you, Jennifer. Same time, I love same you place. All. You, you are God bless. <laughs> all right, good.